So to be honest, I'm not really a big fan of, I don't know what they're called, maybe learning norms or things like that, where we kind of set up these ground rules for when we're doing professional development, right? I think a lot of times we just kind of, someone tells us what we should say and we all agree with it and we just kind of move on. But there is one learning norm that I've actually encouraged people to use and I've used in my own professional learning sessions. And it's just one thing, and it's simply this. All I, all I ask of you today is to learn in a way you'd expect of your students. That's it. And now the question is, what does that mean? What does that look like, right? So what do we expect from our students? And sometimes when we're you know, in education, we kind of hold different rules that we wouldn't ever be okay with our students breaking. Right. And actually uh, utilizing that and kind of thinking about that. And I actually remember this one professional learning session. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. I was in the back of the room and I was listening to the speaker. And I don't know the speaker. They're new to our district. They've never been there before. It was kind of like a one off professional learning opportunity. And she came up to me and she tapped me on the shoulder. She said, Look, I'm talking. Get off your computer. And then I actually turned to the computer and said, I'm blogging about what you're talking about. And that kind of threw everyone off, right? Because I was actually taking the learning and making it my own. And to be honest with you, that's what I expect from my students, not to just be able to regurgitate the things I've said, but to actually really deeply understand it, to make it their own. And this is why I really enjoyed the conversation with Rich is today. Uh, he has a new book out called Rogue Leader, Make the Rules, Inspire Others, and Take Control of Your Own Professional Development Destiny. And really kind of thinking about how when I look at professional learning opportunities, is it something that's done to me or is it something I create for myself? And we have a great conversation about this idea and many other things, you know, being an administrator, uh, what advice you'd give to yourself, you know, as a former curriculum director, now that you're a principal, how would you help yourself through that process? So it was a great conversation. And here's what I encourage you to do. As you are learning from this, create something from it. You know, share a big takeaway, whether it's on Twitter, share in the comments on YouTube, uh, post something on Instagram. Take the learning that you do today and make it your own. That's how we actually take control of our own PD destiny as Rich actually shares. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you and welcome back to another episode of The Innovator's Mindset. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm so blessed today to have Rich Chiz actually join me on the podcast. Uh, he has a brand new book out called Rogue Leader, Make the Rules, Inspire Others, and Take Control of Your Own Professional Development Destiny. Uh, talks really about how we actually, and I, I love this, you, you kind of mentioned this on the podcast, is that professional learning, professional development should be done with, not to people. And I think that's, you know, a lot of people, you, there is some... Uh, uh, bad feelings when we have that that perception. And so uh, Rich is currently a, a principal uh, in Yardville Elementary School in New Jersey. And so uh, Rich, if you can just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today and how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. Yeah, so my name is Rich Chiz. I am a principal, as you said, at Yardville Elementary in New Jersey. Um, I started my career as a fifth grade teacher uh, teaching math and science. And uh, I've done a little bit of everything since. Uh, so fifth grade, uh, basic skills. I was an instructional and technology coach. I was a curriculum director and curriculum supervisor. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of found in, as I was spreading my wings into the curriculum world uh, that I was missing students. So uh, that's kind of how I ended up back in the principal right. chair, uh, back in the building, working with kids and teachers every day. And, uh, you know, that that's where I am now, uh, finding finding my most joy uh, in working with students and teachers each day. So there's actually it's interesting that you say that because there's a misperception that when you become a principal, that you actually are away from kids. And the, the reality is I found that I was around kids all the time because I had like a but I was around more kids more often because I had a willingness to go in the classroom. Do you like like what, how did you find that, you know, when you're in this role, how do you ensure that you still stay connected with kids as much as you do? Yeah, it, it's just being visible, right? And um, it's, you know, morning arrival and dismissal and lunchtime and recess and, uh, you know, getting outside and playing kickball with the kids and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just being present in classes, uh, making sure I'm, I'm swinging by every class every morning to say hello, uh, to greet kids and, uh, you know, see what they're up to, see what they're doing in the classroom. And I think, I think that's important. When kids know who you are in the classroom, um, I think that's the most that we can ask of a principal in the building. 
Yeah, like I when I was a when I was a principal, I try to be in classrooms as much as possible to the point because I think just the title freaks some people out, right? And I'm talking teachers, not just kids, right? And I wanted it that when you entered a classroom, it just was just continued. But I think if it's you know, I've always called it what the, I'm sure you've seen it, the superintendent entourage, right? Where it's a superintendent, some board members, they're, you know, wearing whatever they're wearing and they're all like kneeling down. They do kind of like a, and it's just like, it feels really awkward, but you want it just to be like a norm. You just want it to be like a normal thing. And I, I felt that whenever there was an issue in the office that was sent to me that having those that relationship that i built you know during recess during those other times uh had had made like a significant impact in that conversation i take it could take like a an hour-long conversation that could have happened with that kid if i didn't know them and made it like two minutes right yeah it, it makes it much easier and and uh I, I know what you're talking about it's like those uh kind of record scratch moments right where you, right. you know totally. where somebody walks into the room and all of a sudden the whole room stops and yeah. Um, that's the goal is making sure that that doesn't happen, that uh, kids treat it as, you know, just a part of a regular day when I'm in the classroom. Um, teachers, I hope, see it that same way. And uh, I think over time, you know, I think when I first started in my building, it was a little difficult for some teachers to know that I was coming in every day. But right. over time, they just knew I was there just to kind of see the kids and see what was going on. And um, like you said, it does help build those relationships with kids. It does make it easier to have those difficult conversations later on. Yeah. Um, you know, but again, you can also see what they're learning and and how they're growing as well. So, hey, I, I'm I'm curious. Uh, I've never asked this question, but it's kind of interesting to think about your role. So, when you were the curric when you were in the curriculum, you were like a central office role. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so if if Rich the principal could go and talk to Rich the curriculum person, what what things you'd be like? No, nah, don't do that. Like, is there things that you would have like changed differently in your role? It, it's interesting because I think as a um, as a director of curriculum and, mm -hmm. and uh, when I first started, I was in a small district where I was a department of one. Uh, we eventually grew to a, a department of two or three. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was I think I, I hope at the time uh, forward thinking and, and progressive. Um, so I would hope that there's not much that I would change. But now as a principal, I definitely look back and say, like, you know, as a as a director of curriculum, I had no idea what was going on in every building. And right. I, I think that's the biggest piece is you don't necessarily understand what, um, you know, teachers or even administrators in a building are struggling with on a daily basis, especially in the past couple of years. Um, so, you know, probably one of the things I would do is take a step back, right, is right. just, you know, let's let teachers breathe. Um, let's make sure that they have the support that they need. Let's make sure that they have the materials that they need and uh, really, really allow them to, to be successful. And I think that is something where, you know, it doesn't always happen. And, and now that I'm uh, uh, in charge of a school, you know, I can kind of see where sometimes curriculum pushes too much at teachers um, without, without their input or without, uh, trying to give them the support that they need to implement what they need right. to implement. Yeah. I, I think that's such an important aspect. I, my, my belief in the role of central office is to actually lessen the work of teachers, not to increase it. And that that's where I've, it's where I've struggled because uh, I've, I've seen um, central office sending out surveys at the same time every year and all these different departments that teachers have to do. And part of the surveys is to justify the jobs of central office, right? And it's like just overworking and it's like all this other stuff. And hey, we gotta add this, we gotta add this. And and like you see this, and this might be a little bit of a controversial topic, but like central office staffing has actually uh, statistically has gone up way quicker um, percentage wise than actually teaching staff, right? And it's, and it's kind of the disconnect that, oh, this is really hard at central office, but you know, so we're gonna bring in more people not necessarily being in a school and realizing how hard it is there and then just thinking, oh, they'll be okay, right? So I think that, I think, as you said, being visible, not only as a principal, but you know, when you're working in central office, we'll tell you some of the realities that are happening in that school that you can actually serve as opposed to maybe even create some of the challenges that are happening too. And I don't know if that's something that you maybe see. I know like you work in the school district, so I'm not gonna, 
get you to talk bad about your school district, but I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, in your past roles, you've seen that, you know, maybe from some of your colleagues is that we've created more issues than maybe we've solved. Yeah. And I think that happens uh, pretty often in, in school districts where, yeah. you know, it's uh it's a top down mentality and, and where, you know, somebody at the top doesn't even necessarily mean, <laughs> mean for it to be top down, but right. you know, they, they are implementing something. Um, they're pushing it down on buildings, on teachers, and uh, I, I think it's really the lack of support that is the difficulty, right? So right. if it's a good idea and everybody is all for it, great. Uh, but it's really how do we support teachers in the classroom in implementing it in the classroom, right? So right. what does that look like with students in the classroom? You know, are there instructional coaches that can come in and help and support teachers in how they're implementing right. something? So, um, you know, oftentimes it is difficult to... Um, on all levels. Right. Uh, and I've, I've sat in both chairs. So I've been yeah. on the other end where, you know, you're trying to push something through the district. Um, and it's, you know, you're, you're banging your head against the wall, trying to get everybody on board. Um, but you know, I, and now I'm sitting on the other end and, um, it's, it's that support that's key. Yeah. And, and that actually ties in beautifully. You talk about, um, we, we talked about this a little bit before in another podcast about, uh, your new book, rogue leader, and you talk about professional development. And so like, how do you t tell us a little bit about your book first before we kind of get into the professional development aspect of it? Yeah. So uh, Rogue Leader is my newest book. It is a follow up uh, to my first book, The Four O'Clock Faculty, about professional development. Um, and it really starts with the premise that uh, professional development, the, the term professional development in mm -hmm. education is a dirty word. Right. And how do we get away from that? How do we build systems that will help teachers um, and, and work with and for teachers rather than PD being done to teachers. And I think that's the, the biggest difficulty is often, you know, we're, we're pushing PD at someone mm -hmm. um, as if, you know, here's the solution, do this PD, and then everything will be fine. Right. And uh, that's not really how professional growth or professional learning works. And so uh, Rogue Leader is all about, you know, taking some of that professional responsibility on yourself, um, but also inspiring others to kind of take on that professional responsibility and that professional learning. So when, when is there ever an op or a time where professional development has to be done to teachers, right? Like when, like, Hey, we want this, we want, uh, we want empowerment. We want, you know, uh, we want your voice at the table, but sometimes you just got to do it. Right. Like, w like when, when is that, when does that make sense to do? Yeah. I, I think there's absolutely a time where something does have to be pushed out. Right. Um, but again, going back to what I said before, it's about that support, right? So, mm. you know, this is something that we want all teachers to learn how to do, uh, right. then we definitely need to support teachers in how to do it. So whether it's a, a new program that's being implemented, whether it's a, a new strategy or initiative, um, making sure that you're, you know, providing coaches or, um, you know, multiple professional development sessions, right. um, you know, kind of what I talk about in the book is is getting away from the one and done, you know, the, the buzzword du jour where, you know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we have a great new PD, we roll it out once and teachers should be good. Uh, whereas, you know, con continuous PD is, is often the way to go where teachers have something constantly and consistently that is helping them grow. The, 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 as someone who, you know, is contracted to do work, you know, professional learning opportunities with staff. I can really tell, and I, I, I'm sure you've seen this. I can tell the difference between someone bringing me in because they know my work and it aligns with the stuff that they're doing and they see it as like a, like a bridge. It's something that's going to help them grow in that, in the work that's either happening or about to happen long-term versus who's bringing me in to fill a day because they don't know what else to do. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like, have you seen that before? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's funny because I wrote about that in the book is, you know, like I, I've been the I've been the, the the buzzword guy coming in for one day. And, right. um, you know, like you said, you can very easily tell it's it's when people oh. are sitting, you know, 30 rows from you in the back of the auditorium and, and what, you know, no parts of what you're what yeah. you're saying, because no one has ever, you know, given your message before in uh, in any type of PD. So. I think it is important to, um, like I said, make it consistent, make it continuous, yeah. uh, really, really push a message um, and uh, live the message. That's the important piece. If you're trying to help people grow, uh, you have to you have to live that message.
Well, the, actually, I just I just booked a, an event with a with a group that uh, it was kind of neat because I've been talking to this group for three years. They connect with me about the books I've written, the work that they're doing. They've reached out to me, and then basically they're like years later after we first started talking, they just actually asked me to bring me in. So I I kind of it's like kind of interesting to go into a place where I know people know the work that I talk about, uh, some of the stuff that we're doing, which actually you know makes me up my game because I'm like, hey. Like they already know. Like it's easier when you when nobody knows your stuff because everything's fresh and new, right? But there, you don't want them also to go like, "Oh, we already knew this." We yeah. Knew what this. What else you got? <laughs> yeah. So so that there, there's something powerful. So, um, in your own experience, you know, kind of looking at the lens of professional learning, what would you say has been your best, like as a learner, not as someone who's implementing it? What's been your best professional learning uh, experience? Yeah, so I, I think probably the the number one piece, uh, which I always say is is discussion, right? So um, it's it's generally um, when I grow is is when I'm talking to others and um, learning something from them, right? So um, I'll I'll go back to my time as a teacher. I had the chance to work in an inclusion classroom where I was the regular ed teacher and I was working with a special ed teacher every day. Um, I grew so much as a professional in those three years that I worked with my partner um, just because I had the chance to see what she was doing in the classroom and talk about it every day. Right. Right. Like, why did you do this a certain way? Or why did you ask this question? And I think when you're able to have those conversations on a daily basis, I think that's probably the the biggest piece of growth that I've ever experienced. Um, I I try to do that now for our teachers in the building. Right. Um, I think those daily conversations that we can have um, often uh, lead to more growth than, you know, let's say a, a 45 minute or an hour PD session mm-hmm. where, where somebody's sitting down and telling you how to do something. Um, I think you do grow from those individual conversations. So like, so how do you like this? This is true for me. Well, I, I love what I do today. There's certain aspects of like being in school all the time that I don't miss. One of them is meetings. I cannot stand meetings. And I swear to God, we used to have meetings about meetings. Like, hey, let's let's talk about what we're going to talk about, and and I felt that we would sometimes have meetings uh, and discussions just because it was the first Monday of the month. Do you know what I mean? And it wasn't like, hey, there's anything pressing. There's nothing here. So how do we find that balance of like? As I think conversation is so crucial to the work that we actually do, but I think sometimes we can get caught up in just talking and not actually doing. So how do we ensure that those conversations lead to action, just not necessarily just more conversations? Yeah. So the, the, the first thing I wrote about in the book is uh, meeting f- with a purpose, uh, mm-hmm. meeting for and with a purpose. And uh, um, there's a principal from Massachusetts. Uh, his name is Chris Dodge. Um, and he uh, he actually contributed to the book uh, with the idea of canceling staff meetings. Right. And um, like and, like and it was when he first suggested, it, I was like, wait a minute, you can't cancel staff meetings. And I had that same mentality is we need to do two staff meetings a month. You can't right. cancel them. Right. Um, but the idea being, if you don't have a purpose for why you're meeting, um, you probably don't need to meet, right? And if the meeting needs to be only 15 minutes uh, because you have only 15 minutes of discussion that's worthwhile, then do a 15-minute meeting. And I think once we kind of get past that idea of, you know, uh, meetings for the sake of meetings, and like you right. said, we're sometimes we're meeting about meeting. Um, you know, yeah. it, it has to yeah. it it has to have a purpose. It has to have a why. And I think once we get to that point, then we can understand, you know, that the discussion and the conversations that we are having are important. I'm going to give a shout out to Chris Dodge for canceling staff meetings. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people are like, yeah, we should start doing that too, right? So uh, that is uh, that is amazing. When, when I was an uh, administrator, uh, we, used to t- we used to have like dedicated professional learning days that were designated by a central office, right? And what was happening before is basically they had a PD the entire day. And this is before I was there. And I said, look, I don't think we need to do this whole day. What I would like to do is that we have a dedicated, like we just go hard half day. And then the, the second half is all yours. You do whatever you need to do. Uh, but but here's a commitment I need from you. When we're doing that half day together, we're like all in. We're not kind of our brains are somewhere else because I'm giving you that time to do what you need to do in the afternoon. And I felt like it was pretty successful and people appreciate it because you know one of the best gifts you can give 
I, I think a lot of times, you know, we're given time and then we take it away from people, right? As opposed to giving this. I remember uh, one week we tried this. We actually said, uh, in this afternoon, it's on, it's on your own, no collaboration. Do not email anybody either. So like, just do your own stuff. So you don't have to worry about like catching up to emails and stuff like this. And some people are like, oh, that was like the best. I just had like, because I'm a big advocate of obviously collaboration, but I also like my own time. And sometimes I just need to like sit my thoughts. I need to get stuff done. And I felt my staff was much more in it when we said like, hey, we're, we just need you to be here. And then, then, you know, and obviously everything was with purpose. And we would end that stuff, you know, we, we limited our times of like, you know, staff stuff that we always had to kind of do to catch up on. So I'm, I'm curious your thought about that approach. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great approach, right? And, yeah. um, you know, Chris, when he suggested the idea of canceling meetings, um, it was canceling meetings and giving teachers the time back, right? right? So not only am I canceling this meeting, but I'm sure you have, you know, this list of things that I've assigned to you that yeah. you need to do and you need to complete. So instead of coming to the meeting, take the time to finish some of those things. And I think anytime we can give time back to teachers, Mm -hmm. um, like you said, that could be one of the best gifts that we can give is that gift of time. Um, I know even if we have an extra right. sub or two in the building, you know, I just try to get teachers together, right? Here's 45 minutes. If you and your grade level partner want to sit down and uh, plan for 45 minutes, if we have a couple of extra subs in the building. So I think yeah. anytime we can get teachers um, take more off their plates and I, you know, going back to what you said initially, you know, the administrator should be there to, to help teachers, um, you know, accomplish what they need to accomplish. And sometimes that means taking stuff off of their plates. The, the, uh, the one little trick I used to do is I would, uh, when we do have a staff meeting, I would say, Hey, here's the three things that we need to discuss. But if you have any items that you want to speak to, to put on the agenda, and there's a very specific language that you would like to speak to on the agenda, um, let me know. And then I'll add it to the agenda. So, so they couldn't just say hats in school. And I'd be like, what do, do, what do you want to talk about? Like, what is that? Right. And it's like, well, I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, well, if you're not willing to like actually lead the conversation, I don't, this doesn't seem like a thing that's bothering it. This might be a you thing. Right. And so like, there is like, I, I put some ownership on there too, but I also like got rid of some like really bad conversations. Like, well, the grade two team needs to talk about this. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But that's not the that's not the staff meeting time because like I, if I was in there and I'm not teaching grade two, I'm like, why are we why are we wasting my I got a million things to do. This has nothing to do with me, right? And so it it was really helpful, um, you know, kind of in that process. Uh, one of the questions I have for you when you're talking about professional learning, uh, professional development over, um, obviously I like to call it the blur because I don't know if it's like a year or two years anymore. It's just forever. It seems like it, it's it's like there's this challenge of like, Hey, of course you want people to get better, but like some people just need to get through the day. Right. And so like, what, what how are you dealing with that? How do you, how do you find that? And how's your, like, how's your staff dealing with that? Cause like, I'm sure those days are just like, look, we, don't, we just need to get through today. Right. Like just don't worry about this stuff. Like we just need to get through today. How do you, how do you find that balance? Yeah, it's been an incredible, uh, incredibly difficult uh, balance over the over the past couple of yeah. years. And I yeah. think um, I, I did. Uh, so I, I started writing during kind of the early stages of the pandemic, uh, the book. And um, there is a chapter in there about well-being. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I do talk about how we have to focus on that first. So there have been plenty of times over the past year where, you know, we've had the staff meeting scheduled for Thursday and. You know, I just see where everyone is and know right. that the staff meeting is the last thing that we need to do. Right. right. So a simple right. email. Hey, no staff meeting this week. You know, focus on these things that you need to focus on. Go home and see your family 45 minutes earlier right. than you normally would. Um, and I think that's important for teachers. I think recognizing where people are, um, recognizing that family does come first. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think if you ask any of my uh, colleagues in my building, um, you know, they know what my answer will be if anything is, is family related. So, um, I think we do have to kind of understand where people are first. Um, and I think in order to get them back, uh, you know, I think sometimes a break from PD is something that is necessary. Right. So, um, I think, you know, once, once you do kind of have that break and, and take care of, 
you know, your well-being first, then I think you're you're that much uh, more prepared to come back to professional development and professional learning. Yeah. And there's actually, there's this kind of misconception that if you do that stuff, that your staff is going to be behind or they're not going to be, whereas I find they're going to be, I don't know if the term is more loyal, but more, I guess, invested because you know, you're invested them as people. Do you know what I mean? And I, when I was, um, I, I, I always talk about my one, uh, administrator, she was my principal deputy superintendent. Her name's Kelly Wilkins. I mention her all the time. And, uh, and I was like really kind of out on education and I was like, I don't want to work at the school. Let's see if I'm getting a job somewhere. And I got a job like last minute with her and I was excited about a new change. Right. And weirdly enough, I accepted this job and I got a interview for basically what I deemed to be my dream job at that time, even though I already just accepted having started. And so I didn't want to take this interview behind her back. So I was like new to the school. But I was nervous about like saying like, I want to take this interview because I, I literally have not even started day one. So like, is it my starting on, you know, a bad foot? And so I called her and said, Hey, I know that I've accepted this job and I'm excited to work for you, but I did get an opportunity for an interview for something that I've always wanted to do. And I, I wanted to be honest with you that I do want to take that interview. Would you be okay with that? She said, George, listen, if you, if you get that job, and it's your dream job, you should take it. And we will get someone else to take this position. But if the worst case scenario is you get the, you have the interview and you don't get it, we're going to be so happy that you're on our team. So either way, we'll be okay. But don't, we don't want you spending the year here. We're wondering if you could have got that job. And I'll tell you the second she said that I didn't even want the interview anymore. I'm like, this is the type of person that I just really want to work with. And I, and before I even walked in that building, I would have done anything for her. And it was like, kind of like, cause she really cared about me. I like, I, that's what I felt right in that moment that she cared about me as a person. And I think, I, and it pushed me to grow to heights. That I, I never thought I would because of that investment. I think that's where the, the disconnect is for a lot of people is that when you actually care about people and you back off when you need to, that they somehow will worsen. Whereas I actually think they'll get better. Yeah, I think, you know, it's that simple premise of, you know, when you when you invest in people, they will they'll invest their energy back in you. Right. And I think, you know, that's everything that I try to do as a as a school leader is invest in the people in front of me and next to me. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm a firm believer in the title on the door, not, you know, doesn't necessarily mean anything. Right. Like everybody in the building is a leader, you know, on on days when I'm not in the building. Um, I had a student once ask me, like, who's who's going to be in charge when you're not here? And my answer was everyone. Right. Because that's that's how I feel. Everyone is going to lead the building, um, you know, regardless of whether I'm there or not. And uh, I think when you can invest in people that way, um, show them that you do care. Right. Uh, and that it's genuine. Right. Uh, I've also worked right. with people where it's it's not necessarily genuine. But right. uh, when you genuinely care about people, um, I think they're they're uh, they're able to kind of share that back tenfold with you. So I, I got to ask you this question. Why the title rogue leader? What, like, I don't get it. Explain that to me. I, yeah. and I haven't read the book, so I know there's, there's gotta be, it wasn't just like, what would sound very star Wars ish. <laughs> right. So what's the, what's the, what's the reason behind the title? Yeah. So rogue is a term that came out of the first book. Uh, so it stands for a relevant organized group of underground educators. Um, so the whole idea behind it is um, finding those people who are going to help you grow uh, when you're not necessarily getting what you're supposed to be getting in terms of professional right. development. So for me, it, my, my whole PD path all started uh, when I felt like I wasn't getting what I needed from the administrators. And, and I made a, a crazy assumption when I first started was that, you know, my administrator was responsible for whatever professional development I was going to get. And I had no part in it whatsoever. Um, and I think once I kind of realized like, oh, you know what, it's, it's on me. Like I need to right. figure out how to grow and how to learn. I need to find those people who are going to help me. So um, Rogue is, is that group of underground educators who are going to help you, you know, whether it's the person in the classroom next to you, whether it's, you know, George's podcast, whether it's Rich in his book, you know, whoever it is out there that's going to help you grow. Um, so this, in terms of titling it Rogue Leader, uh, was 
about inspiring others, right? So after you kind of take control of your own PD destiny, uh, going out and inspiring others and helping others to to grow as well. Well, it's funny because I, I got to bring this up. You reached out to me and you're like, hey, my name, and I'm like, I know you. Like I've known you forever, right? And I've been learning from you, which I thought was fascinating because, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the people that you mentioned uh, in our other podcasts, I know them, right? Like I've met them in person. Yeah. I followed them on Twitter. And in these, you said this, uh, like you say, take control of your own professional development destiny. I think this really overlaps with, you know, the title of the podcast, the title of my work, Innovator's Mindset. I actually, like have said this for the last little while, I don't think I've had bad professional learning experiences um, probably in the last 10, 15 years, not because of the content, not because of the presenter, but because I've said, look, I'm going to figure something out for myself because I'm not wasting my time. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull out whatever chunk I need to pull out of this. I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to figure something out. I'm going to become better at this, you know, from this process. And if I've had that experience, because I think a lot of times we actually put that totally on rich has to be good, right? Like one of the things I always say, like if you're listening to this podcast, stop doing something that resonates, write about it, create your own podcast, do something with it, and it will stick with you in a certain way. Uh, I, I've uh, I, I've encouraged people over the years to, if you're going to a, like, a, like a big conference, skip one of the keynotes and write about the one that resonated with you and, and take it. You'll get so much more out of just sitting, listening and listening and listening and listening and, you know, getting more mixed up. I'd rather, you know, do something, walk away with something in depth than actually, um, than actually just kind of, you know, walking away more confused than when I walked in. Yeah, I, I think a hundred percent, like everything to what you just said is we need to, uh, we need to get people out there um, thinking and doing, right? So mm -hmm. if we can get people, um, you know, learning on their own, you know, finding those others that are going to help them uh, learn, then that that's all that I'm asking for, right? Um, I yeah. I wrote in I wrote in the book about uh, there being no such thing as bad professional development, right? right. And uh, I think it speaks exactly to what you just said. It's it's what you make of it, right? Um, you know, if you go in there with the attitude that I'm not going to learn anything, you're probably not going to learn anything. If you go in there with the attitude, right? No matter how bad this is, I'm going to take something out of it, whatever whatever little chunk or whatever little nugget it may be, um, you're going to find something that's going to help. And if it's completely terrible and you, you know, you walk out the door and you, you know, learn about something else, you go online, you write about something, uh, then you are using that time valuably. So I think it is about, uh, you know, what you make of it right. and, and, and taking that control over PD for yourself. Well, the funny thing is, is that even when you learn something, when it's terrible PD, you can, should be able to pick up something. It's like, don't do that. Right. right. Like, don't do that. Like the, uh, I, when I hear someone say, Oh, like they just showed us slides with like bullet points. It was so boring. I'm like, but didn't you just teach like a bunch of kids to do slides with bullet points the other day? Like, why would you punish the next, maybe, maybe it's like a payback. I don't know, but like, why, why would you actually, you know, go through that process? So here's the beautiful thing about writing books. And I, I, I know that this is going to be an easy answer for you. So you're sharing, your learning all these great ideas that you have, with people, but obviously just sitting down and writing it. Um, and, and you, you mentioned Chris Dodge, like, you know, collaborating with other people, what was like your biggest takeaway from writing your own book? So, uh, my biggest takeaway was, um, really what, what we're talking about in terms of the future of professional development. And, um, you know, I wrote the first book, uh, probably six years ago at this point mm -hmm. about changing uh, and shifting professional development. And, um, you know, I didn't want that to be the, the final word on everything that I had to say about professional development, because yeah. it's, it's something that's constantly changing. So I think even in, uh, the absence of professional learning and professional growth and PD over the past couple of years where, you know, conferences died out for a couple of years and yeah. there weren't a lot of opportunities unless we were going online. Um, what I came to realize is that we need to shift PD uh, in terms of what it looks like for the future. So, you know, a lot more on demand, a lot more variety for educators who are busy and overwhelmed and uh, trying to help them in a lot of different ways. So when you wrote four o'clock faculty, when you wrote that book and you were done it, did you think you'd ever be able to write another book or do you just like, yeah, that's, a, that's all I got. 
Like, did yeah. you, what did you feel after that process? Yeah. So I think after I wrote the first one, I was like, you know what? That was, that was crazy. It's done. Like, let me, <laughs> let me get it off to the editor. Uh, and then what's funny is as soon as, you know, and, and going through the editing process, you know, it's a lot of waiting, right? So you send something yeah. out, you're, you're waiting for it to come back. And while I was sitting and waiting, I missed writing. Right. So it was one of those right. things where I had to sit down and, and start putting thoughts onto paper, uh, you know, with, with other ideas. And I think, that's eventually where books number two and three came from. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm blogging all the time. Uh, so it's just, um, I just love the writing process. Well, that's awesome. I, I when I wrote interviews mindset, I'm like, never again, I'm not. That's <laughs> it. And so then you know, I, Katie Novak really pushed me to get writing again. And you know, I, I, I did like that. And there's like, I love blogging, but there is a difference in writing a book, right? There's a challenge to that. So, uh, Rich, Rich, it was awesome to take time out of your day. I'm sure you're not busy. I'm sure, you know, kids are fighting behind you in school, right? And you're just ignoring it, obviously. And you took this. You, so not only did you lead a school the entire day, then you sit down and graciously um, sit down on my podcast. So con for, congratulations on the new book. And for anyone listening, uh, you'll see the link down in the description down below. Uh, Rich is very accessible on Twitter. You can check out his blog as well. All those things will be linked below. But Rich, thanks so much for your time. And thanks for uh, sharing your, your learning with the world. Absolutely. Thanks, George. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.